I will call the meeting to order. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we are in Treaty 1 territory in our traditional homeland uh, of the Métis Nation. My name is Neil Harden. I'm chairing today's panel. With me is Carrie Linklater to my immediate left and Ed Sawatsky to my far left. The assessor is Ryan Valderrama and the recording secretary is Katie Sutherland. We will be hearing applications for revision of the assessment role in accordance with the Municipal Assessment Act. The matters for which revision is requested have been described in each application. We will limit discussion to those matters. The statements of the applicants or assessor make at the hearing are sworn testimony, and anyone speaking to the matters must be sworn in. We advise that comparisons of assessments of properties are not considered evidence of market value by the board. The board is appointed annually by council and is independent of it in the city administration. It makes its decisions on the basis of the evidence provided this hearing and issues a written order that be mailed to all parties as soon as possible. Please note that the uh, board's decisions with respect to an application may be appealed to the Manitoba Municipal Board if the matter pertains to assessed value or classification, or to the Court of Queen's Bench if the matter pertains to the application of the exemptions from taxation. Should you wish to appeal and commission how to do so will be included in the board's order. With respect to the hearing process, I will confirm it and I will confirm the matters to be addressed, not confirm them, uh, with each applicant uh, following the swearing in. We will then have the assessor's testimony followed by, by questions that the applicant may have and then the applicant's testimony followed by questions. Each side will have an opportunity to summarize if they wish. Once all the evidence of an application has been brought forward, the applicant may leave. The process will repeat for each item on the docket today. The session will close after all the applications have been heard and the board will deliver and grant and make its decisions. You will receive the order by registered mail as soon as possible. As information, all public hearings are live stream recorded and will be part of the public record. So we will swear them in. Ryan Baldrama. Do you swear that the evidence you to present is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth? So help you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marshall Navarro. Do you swear that the evidence you to present is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth? So help you, God. Thank you. Okay, so first on the agenda today is 115 Niagara Road. So you may proceed, Mr. Baldrama. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The first property has a file number of 19-2608. It has a roll number of 0802-0934-000. It is located at 115 Nyack Road. We're dealing with the roll year of 2020 using reference date of April 1, 2018. The assessed value is $13,472,000. It is a residential apartment with one building and 10 stories. It has an actual and effective year built out 1977. The property has 98 suites with 126 outdoor parking stalls. It is zoned as residential multifamily <coughs> with a land area of 71,623 square feet, a planned area of 9,260 square feet, a gross floor area of 93,658 square feet. On page 3 are a couple of aerial photos of the subject property. And on page 4 is income valuation workup. It has 96 total units with an average monthly rent per unit of $1,122.52, which is uh, derived from the model. It has a vacancy, vacancy rate of 2.6% an expense ratio of 46.52%, giving it a net operating income of $673,592. Using the capitalization rate of 5%, the capitalized income is $13,471,840. On page 5 are uh, some rent comparables. They are all ranging from $1,119 up to $1,518 average monthly rent per unit. Just below it is the map of the subject property and the comparable rents. On uh, page pages 6 and 7 are the uh, capitalization, capitalization rate chart. 
On page 9, the last page is the 2017 income and expense information. And uh, that's my presentation with the chair. Okay. Questions, Mr. Navarro? Uh, yes. <coughs> um, I'll start with the model estimating a higher rent than the actuals. Was this rent at all adjusted in any way? I'm sorry? Was the rent adjusted? These are, this or is their model. Average. Their model. Okay. And so the, the rents haven't been adjusted in any way? No, not over it, no. Okay. And the expense ratio is estimating um, a lower expense ratio than the actual script. That's also model driven? Yes, it is. And that was not adjusted either? No, it's not. Okay. Now the capitalization rate is 5%. Uh, I'm looking at your chart on page 6, the multifamily. Your rates go from 4% um, on the low side to 7.3 on the high side. Um, 20th percentile and 80th percentile, 490 and 430. Now, as I look over to Collier's tw quarter one, 2018, CBRE and Cushman Wakefield, uh, for high rise and low rise, the range for Collier's is between 5 and 6, 5 and 5.75, and 4.75 and 5.75. Now, I guess that they stratify their, their buildings slightly different, although this is a high-rise, I assume. Would you agree? Yes, it is a high-rise, 10 stories. Okay. Now, did you give any uh, weight to the reporting from these agencies in terms of determining the capitalization rate for this property? No. Um, it's a model-driven. Model-driven. Yes. Okay. And in terms of age, age, does that factor into the capitalization rate? Yes, I believe so. Did you say that 5% is on the lower side? Um, based on our um, range, it's somewhere in the middle, um, maybe just left of the middle. The middle being? Both um, the 4.0 to 7.3 and 4.9 to 5.3. So between the 20th to 80th percentile, it's just left of the middle, I would say, okay. in terms of the 5%. So let me ask if this is right in terms of my interpretation of this. Is the city saying that all properties in the 80th percentile fall into 5.3? It's a range um, in between 20th to 80th percentile, so those are the range from 4.8 to 4.9, sorry, to 5.3. Um, the 80th, all of the 80th percentile may or may not fall in the 5.3 um, range or the <coughs> ending, the higher end. Okay. Can you explain how these percentiles work? If, if you can't, then that's fine. I, I, I'm, I'm just curious as to how they work. Um, person, percentile, um, it's more of you get the all of the samples that are included in the um, the range, and then you just um, adjust it where it's between 20th to 80th, where most of the properties fall under. That's how it is. And then um, anywhere beyond it, which is 19th percentile lower and 81st percentile higher, those are more of um, the um, fewer properties fall in those categories. So the most most of the properties fall between 20th to 80th percentile. Um, your capitalization rates on page 7, um, you calculated these capitalization rates and we have some rebuttal evidence on some of these. Now, <clears throat> in terms of what, how to take these capitalization rates, exactly what is the city saying with these? Is it saying, giving these as samples? It's not evidence that's supporting your capitalization rate, is it? Uh, based, um, if we read through the um, first paragraph, the following is a sample of actual sales that took place during the reference period, and if I go on, the purpose for, uh, for sorry, the purpose for showing these individual capitalization rates is to illustrate the accuracy of the model and substantiate the model-derived capitalization rates. 
they are not meant to be comparable to specific to the subject property. And there's no, obviously there's no workup for this, right? Um, not attached to this evidence, no. Okay. And the burden of proof is on you, correct? Yes, as indicated by the, uh, the act. Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Carrie, do you have any questions on the case this uh, just one. Did you have a chance to inspect the property? Um, no, I wasn't able to. Do you know when it was last inspected? Um, no. Um, there are no permits uh, recently that were open and closed, um, so not in the recent years, no. Okay. I'm At just asking because it's got an effective age of 77. Yeah, which is the same so as the actual year of building. Yeah. Right okay, thank you. That's all thank you. Any questions? questions? Well, 1977 is not a brand new building. No, it's not, sir. Um, so you think this is a building that falls within the uh, 80 percent range? Just barely. Yes. Um, it's one of those properties um, that are in the bulk where um, it, it's between 4.9 to 5.3 percent. And how much older would it have to be to get to say 5.3? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, all I know is um, these ones are samples, not based on age. So the bulk of our sap, of our observations, I should say, fall between 4.9 to 5.3, more than more than um, more than half. I'm pretty sure. But the model gave you five. Yes. Good. And it's based on... And you, did you think about that? Yes. Did and you uh, analyze that? Yes. And uh, it's pro it's giving us... Um, it's indicating that, you know, it's based on age, location, and the size of the property. Um, the age meaning um, there's a cutoff between uh, within the 75, 1975 range uh, in terms of the year built. So... Um, that's why it's giving it a lower instead of the usual that I saw around 5.3. Now the size of the property is fairly large when you look at the land to land ratio of 7.7. .7. Uh, do you think that means that uh, another apartment block could be built on this property? Uh, mm, It depends on the zoning, um, sir. Um, there is a limit uh, of how big and how much, um, in terms of the density, how much um, will be built on a certain given land area. Well, when I'm looking at the map that you provided, the, the property immediately to the right has two buildings on it. Correct. And it, those two buildings take up a lot more space than yours. Now, I don't know if they're 10 stories high or not, but looking at the shadows, they might even be higher than 10 stories. Yes, um, it looks like they are um, higher than 10 stories. Uh, yeah, correct, sir. Um, there could be. Um, it, for, as I mentioned, uh, for as long as the zoning will, would allow it, then um, that parking lot on the right or to the right of the building may still suit another, um, another building. My question then is, did the large land area cause you to move in the direction of 5% cap rate rather than something around 5.3. That is that a factor? That I am not 100% um, sure, um, sir. Uh, I don't think it plays a lot of weight. If it does, uh, it's not much. It may not affect it uh, that much. Okay. It's more on the income rather than uh, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I do, concerning the cap rate. Um, do you have a, a, does the city have a, a split in years of when the cap rate moves? You know, apartments, you know, prior to 55 or X, or, and 55 to 65 or X? And I think you do, and, and can you tell me what it is? I don't memorize it. I don't memorize the range. I don't have the range with me. Um, I believe we do have that, um, Madam. But I just, um, I just don't have it. Okay. 
Yeah. You don't have it. Okay. No. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, just looking at the photo on piece three, and then all the, 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 the parking to the right of the building and it is for the building itself. And if you were to build something there, then you'd, you'd have to do something else for parking. Uh, I believe there are uh, requirements, uh, bylaw requirements for parking for apartments. And, and that's correct, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, uh, for as long as they follow the, the zoning, um, whatever the guidelines would be for parking and all that, they can build on it. However, if they are required for a number of parking, they might need this for parking. Um, but um, Mr. Solatsky made a good point. Right beside it, there's a, a property that almost occupied the entire, well, not the entire, but two-thirds of the lot with two buildings in it. So we don't know where they might have underground parking. Or exactly. They may have um, underground parking, or I'm not sure what the, um, what the other property has in terms of the characteristics of the uh, parking. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Those, those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you can proceed, Mr. Navarro. Okay. Um, if you turn to page two, you can see a picture of the property, uh, front view. Again, this is uh, 115 Niagara Road, 10-story high-rise apartment building, <clears throat> built in 1977, has an effective age of 1977, 96 units, including 18 one-bedrooms, 78 two-bedrooms. Uh, total glo gross floor area, 94,292 square feet, um, and a reported 126 outdoor parking stalls. Um, the site size, again, is 1.6 acres, so an RMFL, uh, residential multifamily large. Um, on page five, you can see our little blurb about site specific. We use site specific characteristics here. Um, so if you turn over to page six, um, the effective gross income that we're using on this property is one million two hundred twenty-one thousand eighteen dollars Vacancy of 2.7%. Uh, expenses of $662,999. That's eighteen thirty-two per suite or 54.8%. Gives us a net operating income of $546,906. Um, and we are using a capitalization rate of 5.75. And again, that is according to our um, um, Altus categories um, in terms of good locations. Um, so you can see the chart there for the capitalization rates. I'll just get into the capitalization rates in a, in a moment. Um, the value that we're asking for is 9511000 for 2020. Uh, on page 9, you can see our workup again. Uh, the potential gross was $1,221,018. Um, 2.7% vacancy. Effective gross of $1,188,600. Now there was also laundry here, parking, uh, and miscellaneous income, and that brought it down to one million two hundred nine thousand nine hundred five dollars. Again, expenses of fifty four point eight percent gives us a net operating income again of five forty six nine zero six, five point seven five capitalization rate, giving us a value of nine million five hundred eleven thousand four hundred ten dollars. Now, in terms of the Capitalization rates. I'll just briefly go over this report. Um, yeah, I don't think uh, <coughs> I'm not going to go over the entire report. Um, I think we can pick the more important points, and that is in the first couple of pages. Um, so you can see that um, the Altus 2020 capitalization rate study, um, how we categorize these properties. Um, so we, we go by years, so pre-1946, 1946 to 1959, 1960 to um, 1979, 80 to 97, and 98 plus. Um, and you can see the capitalization rate ranges there. 
for each one of those categories. So in the paragraph below that chart, I'll get into this area here, uh, the city appears to break down their cap rate by age and by number of units less than or equal to 10 units, 11 to 19 units, and 20 plus units. Departments with less than 20 units have low cap rates, have low cap rates below 5 or 5.3. In addition, there appears to be variations based on location. Neither the city nor Altus makes any distinction between low rise and high rise. Change in cutoff year. Altus changes the cutoff year between, um, cutoff year built from 1975 by the assessor to 1980. And you can see these. You can see the reason why in, appendix, uh, in the appendix, pages 91 to 93, from the assessor's manual showing apartments built by age category. On page 93, the largest number of apartments is in the age group 1960 to 1974, with 716. And the second highest group from 1975 to 1997, with 422. Uh, we believe the largest group of apartments was built in the 1970s, and the apartments in that decade are very similar to each other. Therefore, it is not reasonable to have a cutoff in the middle of that decade with two different cap rates. One of the differences in age groups is that the standard width of fridges and stoves were 24 inches in the 1970s and changed to 30 inches in the 1980s. We believe that all apartments, all apartments built in the 1970s should have the same cap rate and that the cutoff should be 1980. The assessor has the burden of proof to show why apartments built between 1975 to 1979 are superior to 1970 to 1974, or that there is a significant difference. Also, the increase of apartments built after 1997 was 93 as of January 2015, to 130 as of May uh, 1, 2017, and 156 as of January 2019, indicating greater pressure for older properties relating to rents, vacancy, and level of repair and maintenance. The next page over, again, you can see uh, the comparison with the previous cycle and how we've adjusted these things. Um, so I'll let you look at the, the chart in terms of its uh, the difference between 2018 and 2020. Again, for 2020, the assessment, uh, the assessment department has variations depending on the number of units, less than or equal to 10 units, 11 to 19, and 20 plus units. Departments with less than 20 units have low cap rates below 5 or 5.3%. In, adjust, in addition, there appears to be variations based on location. Um, for the 2018 assessment, the assessment department has a premium of 0.75 for the north end. The assessor also has a cap rate of 6 for row housing regardless of age. Um, page number 3, you can see some of the sales that we've looked at. Um, and this is 210 St. Mary's, 403 St. Anne's, and so on and so on. Uh, <clears throat> the average cap rates, the newer built, uh, 2006 plus, and average cap rate for 1966 to 1974. Um, beyond that, we have some CNBC information and some general market information. And starting in page six, we also have the workouts for each one of these properties that we looked at. Um, that is my presentation. Okay. Questions, Mr. Bongram? Um, on the cap rate study, um, Mr. Chair? Um, um, his oh. presentation in general, I guess. Okay. Um, first, I uh, just want to ask on uh, page 9 of the brief, our presentation for the subject property. <coughs> um, are these all... Uh, based on actuals. Um, the subject's stabilized uh, column, are, they, are these all based on actuals? So we look at the actuals, um, however they are stabilized. Um, so the adjustments that were made were made by the person doing the workup. Um, in some cases they're making adjustments that are uh, contrary to the specific um, actuals. However, there there is a reason there as to why they're making these adjustments. Um, so, yes. So these are all actuals? Um, so that is the matter that I talked to you about in terms of my questioning of you and, and the cap rates that the city is producing. 
Right. So when we look at your cap rates, we can't really do anything with them. We can't question you on them. Um, it's moot because there's no there's no argument behind it. There's no stabilization or any expense history. Uh, there's no workup for them. So um, it's it's not something that we can question. Um, and again, that the burden of proof is on you. Um, so we've put our work out there. We're willing to defend it. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> On the uh, cap rate study, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'm just like i would just like to ask: um, all the NOIs that were calculated here to derive the cap rate from the sales, are these all um, actual NOIs? So, um, <clears throat> the, for the most part, yes, these are actual NOIs. Um, that's why we're actually including three to five years of actuals. Uh, we stabilize those, and then we weigh that against the sale. Um, I think that is the proper methodology of actually calculating a, a capitalization rate uh, according to appraisal standards. And um, that's my question. My rebuttal will come after it, if I'm not Sure. Okay, Terry, do you have questions of <coughs> uh, Lee Pellant? Yes. Uh, did you have a chance to inspect the property? Uh, no, we didn't. Um, what I can say about apartment properties in general is, is that the rent is to be reflective of the condition of the property. Um, so if you have lower rents, it tends to be indicative that their condition is not good. Uh, so if the rents are out there, the repairs and maintenance is out there, that means that these people are doing enough to keep the standard of this property um, to where it can be marketed easily in the marketplace. Now, true. The, the cap of the, there was the question of the effective age. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really pay attention to the effective age of these properties because we can assume that most apartment buildings have been improved upon. So take the effective age of the grain of salt, um, because it is probably not uh, uh, an accurate reflection of what's there. Now, the rents, if you look at them, and you see that they are on par with what's going on in the marketplace, uh, that they're not artificially low for some reason, for example, social housing, or they're just low because we have a case of a uh, a building owner who is not really keeping up the building. Um, we don't want to label them, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, in those situations, uh, you can have effective ages that may mirror their actual date built. Uh, in this case, I would say that for the area, uh, they're charging rents that are appropriate for this area. Um, so that. The question of the effective age and whether things have been adjusted, well, again, that's what's being captured in the rent, too. Okay. Um, so, hopefully that answers your question. Yes. I'm just going to respectfully say I, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's true for all properties. At least the ones that I have seen, there have been anomalies here. You know, 1977, they still have green stones, so. Absolutely. And I think in some cases they would probably re be reflected in, in the rent some, somewhat. Now, if they haven't replaced those stoves, I mean, yeah, there are anomalies. Um, most apartment buildings that I've gone into where everything has, looks like it's at market, um, typically upgrades have been built, uh, ha well, upgrades have been made over time. Um, it's, it's the rare time that you actually take a trip back to the 1970s and when you walk into one of these buildings. It can happen, but I, I think for yes. the most part, um, most building owners, especially if they are managed properly, um, will have <coughs> made these changes over time. 
so the effective age, I think, is something um, I, I tend to disregard to the point because we can assume that a lot of these buildings have been upgraded over time. Did you um, did you bring this property to the board last assessment period? Uh, me in particular? No. Um, yes. I would say that all just all just did. Yeah, but not myself. Do you know what uh, the assessment was last time? No. That's all the questions. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Yes, I'm curious about your uh, statement about most apartments were built in the 70s and they're sort of the same build, yeah. same standard. And you mentioned Stolfith as an example. So, um, and if you look at yeah, go ahead. If you look at the large uh, part of construction of apartment buildings in the city of Winnipeg, and, and this can go through Canada in general. The big push by the federal government and Canada Mortgage Housing, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, came in the late 60s and early 70s, and they introduced uh, new programs to stimulate the economy and build new apartment buildings. So when you say that the largest sector of apartment buildings uh, were built in the 1970s, that, that is actually supported by the, the programs that were in place at that time, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. That is when the large builds happened. Um, and so you're saying that the way you divvy up the, the ages uh, compared to what the city does, you're saying that the 70 group should be at the same cap rate. Or similar cap rate because similar cap rate because again built to similar standards built at similar times um, yeah th there will be variations in some construction methods but uh, for the most part we have three sectors or what I would say is post 1998 there was a period a large period of construction after that but um, 1970s was by far the largest um, and again we yes the the point of contention here is, is why separate it? I mean, there's, there's essentially a block of construction that happened during that era, and most of it was built to similar standards. So then relative to the question that was raised just previously, if uh, you have stoves that are smaller, and you, you make improvements to these 1970s apartments, and it seems to me that the rental cost would be quite expensive because you would have to change the cabinetry, et cetera, to accommodate whatever the current standards are. Yeah. Now, is that happening? Um, well, as Ms. Linkletter said, I mean, there's going to be some anomalies in there. Um, but yeah. Um, I would say that most of the buildings that, at this point that have been uh, changed over time have been retrofitted for newer, wider stoves. Um, Is that reflected in the rental costs, repair costs? That's, uh, yeah, I mean, over time. I mean, it, those, those things would have been absorbed over the past 40 years since this thing was built. And again, the, the change happened in the 1980s. So again, we're still talking about quite a long time ago. Thank you. Well, okay, if we're uh, getting into this then, uh, during the early 80s, I think, was when they first brought in the rent controls guidelines, and there was also a peak in interest rates, so that might, and if I recall correctly, the, there was very little construction activity in that period. Uh, well, I, and I think, in general, had the federal government not stimulated the economy with these programs, there probably wouldn't have been um, construction in the 1970s either. Um, it was because of the hand of the government that all of this um, construction occurred during the 1970s. So at different, at different times in the 80s, right? Inflation, uh, inflation was high, interest rates were high, uh, the market was not good for building at that time. Um, 
and, and that was the general economy throughout the world. I mean, it wasn't just Canada. Like, the rest of the world was experiencing that too. Okay. Uh, my question now, you had some rebuttal evidence you wanted to present? Yeah, just like, uh, submit them. There's a summary that I've already... Um, summary. Um, all the rest are pictures and um, attachments of um, the IMEs that were submitted to our department. Um, there's just two, four, six, seven out of, of how many that um, Altus has submitted. Um, the first one would be uh, 210 St. Mary's Road, which was sold in February 2018 for 830000 um, based on the 2018 NOI or INE that we have received, uh, there was an NOI of 34,194, which calculates or which comes up to uh, a cap rate of 4.12%. Um, this is considering that there is so, there's a very high RNM on this uh, property. Uh, for 403 St. Anne's, uh, it was sold in January 2015 for uh, 1,516,000. The cap rate uh, was we we I cal we calculated a cap rate of 5.46 percent. Um, I have the 2015 INE um, attached, which has an NOI of 82,850 dollars. Uh, 2013 and 2014, there were no um, um, no INEs that um, I can that I can find. Um, it was a renovation period as well. Uh, 155 Maiten, there's no INEs that uh, I can find in our files. Um, and then two th two, uh, sorry, 215 Laverin Drive, it was sold in 2017, March 2017, for 1,150,000. Uh, I used 2015 to 2017 INE NOI, uh, stabilizing them or averaging them at $50,637.24 which produced a cap rate of 4.4%. Uh, 277 Langside, uh, it was sold in January 2018 for 3 million. I used uh, 2015 to 2018 NOI, which produced a stab, uh, an average NOI of $167,114.75. It has a cap rate of 5.57 as per the calculation. If I remove the 2015 or excluded the 2015 NOI, the cap rate is at around 6%. 718 Beach Avenue, it sold in September 2017 and stabilized at 58, uh, stabilized NOI at $58,393.90. It produced or calculated a cap rate of 5.46 percent. I used 2015 to 2017 INE. And the last one is uh, 100 South View Crescent. It sold in October 2015 for 38 million. It a cap rate of about 5.05 percent using the 2017 INE uh, net operating income. Um, there was nothing uh, on file for 2016 which I could have used. Um, it's a almost a relatively new building back in 2014, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, or 2013. And, um, and that's, um, that's all the rebuttal I have to um, so check. Okay. Any questions uh, besides your only rebuttal? Yes, um, I am going to need just a minute or so to go over this.
if we could um, refer to um, to Ken St. Mary's on the assessor's um, rebuttal evidence on the first page where he has the workup for 2018. I and E NOI is equal to 34,194. Commentary regarding very high R and M per suite. Now, I'm looking at 210 St. Mary's at this point. I'm seeing 11 suites and an R and M per suite of $332. Now, you have an R and M of $2,617 per suite. Can you explain? Mm -hmm. What we've done in this situation is that we've averaged out the three years. Um, yes, that's correct. And um, I've used the um, numbers available. I have 2617 per suite. Right. Um, I was looking at the maintenance and repair um, line. Okay. It's uh, 28,787 that was reported in here. For the period ending 12-31-2018? Yes, that's correct. What is the reference date? April 1st, 2018. So, is this past the reference date? Yes, and I look for 2017 and I can't find anything on, on our files. Uh, there could be some that submitted, but um, when I was looking, uh, I just saw uh, 2018 INE. Okay. But you, you are aware that the sale occurred in February 2018? That's correct. Yeah, okay. that's right. So something could have happened after the sale to increase that RNN, could it not? There could be. Okay. okay. In terms of your four oh three St. Anne's, you came up with a five point four six um, capitalization rate, correct? Correct. And you had We note that there was a renovation period here between 2013 and 2014, correct? Correct. Okay. So the, the property was bought for the intention of renovating in the future? I don't know what the intent of the sale. Okay. Now, did you read the commentary at the bottom of our workups? Which workup? So I'm looking at my own for 403 St. Anne. That would be page 7 of the capitalization rate report. Yes. Okay. So rehab, two years before sale, windows, kitchen cabinets, countertops, appliances, pictures, flooring, hallways, roof and boiler, not upgraded. Rented high end rehab five hundred and thirty seven thousand in twenty thirteen. Rent roll in July twenty fourteen showed one bachelor suite vacant. Um, did you make any of those adjustments also? Um, looking at the page seven, two. So the income seems to be higher on the subject stabilized column at one hundred and fifty nine thousand. Um, and I use. If, if I may shorten this. Okay. Um, um, again, it's, it's difficult to look at this without having you compile it all into some type of pro forma or a, a workup like this and look at this because I'm having to flip page by page to look at exactly what's been done here. Mm -hmm. um, 
as I mentioned earlier, this was, um, Mr. Chair, this was done um, based on act, straight up NOI, actual NOI that I can find. <coughs> um, other than that, um, in terms of uh, the pro forma that's being done, uh, the methodology that was used to come up with this um, cap rate uh, with Altus, I mean, it's pretty uh, detailed and extensive. Um, however, my um, my methodology was just straight up actuals as against uh, the sale. I, I have no further questions. Okay, Terry, do you have any questions on the rebuttal? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, do you have the years of the buildings? I didn't, uh, I didn't see it on there. For the years, no effective years or year built. Um, yeah. No, I don't have them. They're included in my capital. Thank you. That's all the questions. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, like, I'm trying to understand what's the one point that you're trying to make to the board about what you presented here? Because the, the cap rates are in the same range as yours and his. So what's the point you're trying to make? Well, there are some cap rates here that are lower than um, if we're using actual um, NOI. And um, I'm just trying to show uh, that it's possible that there could be uh, some cap rates that are lower than 5%. Um, and also, at the same time, uh, we look at some observations, yeah, one, one of which is the 210 St. Mary's. If there's a high R&M, I mean, it's going to lower down the NOI, which reduces the cap rate as well. Uh, we've been observing that um, a lot of properties uh, with higher uh, R&Ms are uh, well maintained, and yet uh, they are uh, being valued or calculated with a higher cap rate, um, not from our side. And it seems that um, from my perspective, uh, my, my, my opinion on that one is, if you have a well-maintained property, uh, it seems that it would be more attractive and it would reflect to a higher uh, valuation. And that's all that I'm, um, I, I mean, a, a personal opinion on that. That's what I want to know. And um, a lower RNM would mean that uh, a property is not that well maintained and may not command a good value uh, for a for a potential investor. If I'm a potential investor, of course, I mean, uh, if I look at a property with a well maintained, uh, or that's well maintained, then I mean, wow, I don't need to invest a lot of money in the future. The other question I have is, uh, uh, who prepared this uh, rebuttal package? Is it you specifically? Yes, I did. You alone. Uh, on this one, yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I have no questions on the level, so uh, I accept. In fact, the is this property. And again, uh, keep the uh, three by eleven is for the files. <laughs> I have an extra copy of that. Sure. I have, I have my own. Thank you. Thank you. property has a file number of 19-2797. It has a roll number of 08002166800. It is located at 86 Nayakwa Road. We're dealing with the roll year of 2020 using reference date of April 1st, 2018. The assessed value is $10,696,000. It has one building with three stories 
in an actual and effective year built of 2011. It has 50 suites with 58 indoor parking and 12 outdoor parking. It is zoned as residential multifamily with a land area of 39,231 square feet, a planned area of 17,239 square feet, and a gross floor area of 51,717 square feet. On page three are a couple of uh, aerial photos of the subject property. On page four is the income valuation summary. There are 50 units with average monthly rent per unit of $1,400.78, which is a model-derived um, rent. It has a vacancy rate of 2.6%, an expense ratio of 34.67%, giving it a net operating income of $534,802. Using the capitalization rate of 5%, the capitalized income is $10,696 thousand and forty dollars. On page five are some rent comparables. They're all ranging from one thousand three hundred seventy seven dollars up to one thousand five hundred eighteen dollars average monthly rent per unit. And just below it is the map of the subject property and the comparable rents. Pages six and seven are the capitalization rate charts. Uh, Beginning page 9 to the last page is the 2017 income and expense information for the subject property. And uh, that's my presentation to share. Any questions, Mr. Navarro? Um, as we know, that th there's no distinction between um, high rise versus low rise, correct? Um, in our church? Yeah. Um, none. Okay. And this property has the same capitalization rate as the previous one, same area? Yes. Would you say that the location is the strong factor here? Just because there doesn't seem to be too much in common between these two buildings, so I'm assuming that location is what uh, is driving this capitalization rate. I would say yes. Um, and as we reported in our capitalization rate, it seems that for smaller units, um, the capitalization rate seems to go down. Can you explain why that is? As the, I'm sorry, as the gross floor area? Or? Yeah, so um, if you uh, remember the commentary that we had in terms of the Apartments with less than 20 units have low cap rates between 5 and 5.30. So this would also fall into that, correct? Can you explain yes. why, why that would be? Um, <coughs> no, I'm not sure how, um, aside from all the factors, age, location, and size. Oh, disregard that, actually. There's, this is 15 units. Right. This is not 20 units. Okay. No, I'm just saying that. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Um, so location seems to be one of those things here in this area. It looks um, like it. Now, do you know what type of construction this is? It says a construction class of uh, wood or steel frame exterior walls. I would assume this is a wood wood frame. Okay. Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay, Terry, any other questions? No questions. Thank you. I don't think so. You get parking uh, indoor and outdoor, 58 units. Yes. Uh, was there revenue from parking as well? Um, it's uh, it's already a model um, derived potential rent, so um, okay. it's included there. Oh, it's a gross. Thank you. No Thank you. Question. And you had that question? Yes, sorry. Um, Go ahead, Matt. So this was a, a build in 2011. Do you have anything in your notes for um, permits? No, um, I don't have 
Talking about how much, because there's a land sale here, I'm assuming, in February 2010. Yeah. For 600. Yeah, it is a land sale. Um, however, in terms of the construction cost, I, um, I missed that one. I wasn't able to uh, check on how much it is. Okay. Um, and your cap rate is model driven again? Yes, it is. So just curious, because, well, as stated by the appellant, I mean, it's the same cap rate as the previous five, sorry, I can't see. Uh, five percent. Yeah. Yet this building is a 2011. Previous That's building correct. was 77. Sorry, not really a question, just a statement. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and I have no questions, so you can proceed with your presentation. Okay. Um, if you turn to page, sure. I have to ask, was it, did you get this in black and white? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize. I don't know why that was done. Um, we could turn to page six, actually, uh, to work up. So we have a potential gross market rent of um, 798240 50 suites. Uh, we've got 2% vacancy on this. That gives us an effective uh, gross rent of $282,275, which we've added $31,680 in parking rent and $3,678 in miscellaneous income, giving us a total of $817,633. We've applied a 42.6% expense ratio to this. That is um, $347,947. Gives us a net operating income of $469,687. And we've applied a capitalization rate of 5.75 to this, giving us an income of 8,168,462. Um, if you look at this building, again, it is a three story building. Um, there's not much that we have in terms of information on this building, but looking at the construction of this. Um, this may be a wood frame uh, building, and uh, if you're familiar with this, uh, the city of Winnipeg allows, now allows, I believe, up to four or five stories construction of wood, wood frame buildings now. Um, previously, this was not something that was allowed. Um, so in terms of the quality of the building, we think that it's probably not as not typical um, not not a typical construction design for this age and this era um, hence I think we, we made an upward adjustment on the capitalization rate um, that is my presentation Any questions Mr. Lennon? I'm just curious on that page six um, workup. Um, again, um, the subject stabilized is uh, we stab the revenue has been stabilized based on market or actuals. Um, we typically use actuals. Um, so here we have the dates for them above. Oh, right. right. So 2017, 2016, 2015. Um, so if we stabilize them, average them. Yeah, we average them and then we stabilize them. Um, we've included parking income and I said miscellaneous income. The rest of the bid comes out of the INEs that are submitted to the city for expenses. Taxes are actual taxes, they're not estimated. Um, 42.6 is the actual expense ratio for the property. Okay, that's uh, all the questions I have, Mr. Chair. Okay, Carrie, any questions? 
Yes, Mr. Navarro, I apologize. I just missed what you were saying about bumping your cap rate. So our cap rate for this property should be 5.25 based on the age. Sorry, but you said something about the wood construction. Wood construction, exactly. So not typical that we see this type of construction. We see it more often now. We see it as inferior. What we see in most of the apartment stock is either masonry design or steel frame structures. So then you had a chance to inspect this property? No, no. So you're just going off notes? Yeah. Sorry, is this some standard in the building or construction? The code was changed recently. At one point, I believe the max that you could build a wood frame structure was three stories. Right. Sorry, I guess what I'm looking for, no, sorry, I heard that, but I guess I'm looking for, do you have any, you're just giving verbal, you have nothing. Oh, in terms of the building code? Yes, thank you. No, I don't have anything regarding the building code. I am under oath. Of course. I can say that the building code was changed to allow for this. Thank you. Any other questions? I think you've tried to explain it, but it still floors me that the 2011 building is the same cap rate as 1977. They did that. Not I. Yeah, but in your case. I get what you're saying. You guys are both sticking to your guns. Reasonably, 5.25 is where we should have cut it off. If we were to stick to our capitalization rates, 5.25 is where it should have been cut. Okay, thank you. No further questions. All right, and, okay, you say you take the expenses then straight from the. So just to give you some background on this, Mr. Hardy. We, when we say we use site-specific characteristics, in the previous property we included a little blurb about site-specific. Now that came out of a municipal board order. We think that the best representation of a property is its actual income and expenses. And part of the problem with the model is that we feel that there's too much variation in the apartment stock. Sometimes in terms of what's been put into it, in terms of like the model itself. So that's where the board said that the actuals are, in fact, the best method for looking at the income potential of the property. We follow this. We use the actuals. We've actually always done this. If you look at our previous cycles, we were always. I'm not debating that. I'm just saying that most of the time we do have the raw information, financial statements that this came from, so we can look at them and see how this relates and whether we agree. Well, we got one. Yeah. But we don't have anything from 2015 or 14 or 15. Yeah. Especially with repair and maintenance. We often scrutinize that to make sure there's no capex in there and that sort of thing. That was the point I was trying to make. Point taken. Yes. I will start adding the actuals into the brief itself. Okay. My apologies to all those cheese that pulled out. We use that. We typically just do a summary of them. And that is the workup. Again, we're not. That's why we put 2017, 2015, 2016 as they are. And then we average them out. And then we stabilize them. Yeah. But what is there is a reflection of what's actually in the findings. So we're not changing those. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
but it does. Uh, it gives you a bigger picture, a bigger picture, and uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, well, when, when the, if you look at line 27, you repair and maintenance. There's one year that's significantly above, <coughs> and the other year. So that leads me to question: Well, what happened that year? Uh, right. And is that reflective, or was there some major repair that, for, for whatever reason, was necessary that year? Absolutely. Uh, that's a valid question. Um, what I would say is, is that's why we go through the process of stabilizing these figures. Um, so we wouldn't take one year that's artificially high, in our opinion, um, and use that. Um, because that, again, that would essentially increase the expense ratio where we have, where we to do that. So um, part of the process of stabilizing is um, also doing it in a, in a way that's fair. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> It's going to be the hotel. Yeah. Okay, we will move on to 761 Blue Lake. Is it 261? 261. Yeah, what am I saying? I'm looking at. I don't know. 261 Blue Lake. Has a file number of 19-2508. Has a roll number of 0607551000. It is located at 261 Goulet Street. We are dealing with the roll year of 2020 using reference date of April 1st, 2018. The assessed value is $12,722,000. It is a residential apartment with one building and six stories. It has an actual year built of 1964, effective years, years built of 1964 to 1984. It has a 105 suites with 51 outdoor parking stalls. It is zoned as a residential multifamily with a land area of 45,912 square feet, a planned area of 19,030 square feet, and a gross floor area of 105,025 square feet. On page 3 are a couple of aerial photos of the subject property. On page 4, income valuation summary. There are 105 units with an average monthly rent per unit of $1,043.21, which is a model of derived rent. There's a vacancy rate of 1.8%. Expense ratio of 50.72%, giving it a net operating income of $636,099. With a capitalization rate of 5%, the capitalized income is $12,721,980. On page 5, there are some rent comparables. Uh, they are all ranging from $1,044 to $1,282, average monthly rent per unit. Uh, I guess the, um, the map um, just for some reason is not uh, did not break. Uh, I apologize. Uh, pages six and seven are the capitalization rate charts, and on page nine and page ten, 
Uh, this is the 2017 income and expense information. And uh, that's my presentation, Mr. Chair. Any questions, Mr. Yes. Um, The vacancy here is model driven, obviously, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, did you look at the vacancy, the actual vacancy for this property? Oh, looks like, uh, yes, it's based on um, number on page 10. There's a uh, vacancy in there. It's about Twenty seventeen is about ten point thirty seven percent. And you have no laundry and parking income on this property, correct? Um, the rent the potential gross potential rent um, includes um, all the rents that are in the, that um, all the income. Yeah. Okay. It's in the income. Okay, so it takes in the income. How is it adjusted then? It adjusted in terms of um, when I look at your effective income versus my effective income, there's still a difference there. So this is all model adjusting. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and five percent cap rate. Again, uh, it's model driven. Yes. Model -driven. Okay. Those are my questions. Okay, uh, Carrie, any questions? Um, yes, yeah. Did you have a chance to uh, inspect this property? No, I wasn't able to. Okay. Do you have anywhere in your notes the last time it was inspected? No. Um, no I wasn't um, able to get that one. Um, okay. I do note that there is a type of year built of 1964 to 1984, but um, more information. Okay. Do you know what's driving that uh, 1984 effective here? Uh, no, I wasn't able to um, look into that. Um, okay. Um, page 10 of your brief. Yes, ma'am. Um, maintenance repairs. Looks really high. Yes. Um, I'm just going to calculate it per unit. Um, that's about shy of 5,900 per unit on the 2017, and on the 2016, it's even way higher. Okay. Are you aware of any issues that this building may have? Um, I have no, no, I am not aware of any issues. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. And any questions? Well, uh, as you <coughs> did not or could not provide a map, uh, are these uh, comparable all within the decent range of each other? Yes, uh, they're within um, the same market region. Uh, sorry. Other questions. Okay, Terry stole my question about the uh, maintenance. Thing. Looking very high. Uh, okay. Um, so we can proceed with another. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, The property is located on Foulet Street east of Traverse Street in St. Boniface. Um, slightly different location than the other property on Niagara. Um, the improvement is six stories and masonry wall structure built in 1964 and is presently used in residential. Um, 105 units, 13 bachelors, 60 one bedrooms, 32 bedrooms, 32 bedrooms, and two three bedroom units. 51 outdoor parking stalls. Um, if you turn to page four, um, 
Again, we're using site-specific characteristics. I'll ask you to turn to the uh, workup on page 8. And again, we've looked at three years here. Uh, we have a stabilized potential market gross of 1,277,000. 998,000. We've applied 5% vacancy to this. Effective gross of 1,214,098. To this, we've added laundry income and parking income. Uh, that gives us an effective gross income of $1,277,074. Uh, we've applied a 48.9% expense ratio or $624,000 gives us a net operating income of $653,074 and we've applied a capitalization rate of 5.5 to this giving us an income of $11,874,880. Um, I'm open for questions. Okay, Mr. Governor, any questions? I have no questions specifically. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. Do you, um, Sorry, page 8 of your brief, line 27 under your repair and maintenance. You've got two figures uh, prior to the beginning of year 2015. Are those representative of 2014 and 2013? Okay. Do you know uh, what the jump is on the maintenance? And it's pretty darn high. Um, and that's why we didn't take them into account. So. Um, this would be sweet refurbishments. Um, so some of that would be capital in our opinion. So we, again, stabilized it downwards. Um, did you inspect the property? No. Okay. So. Notes. Notes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so were you surmising about the sweet refurbishment? Or? No, no. They, uh, um, that, that would not be typical of a uh, building. Um, so that is refurbishments going on. Well, for this age category, so 1984 falls into the, the um, second to last at the bottom of 1980 to 1997, 5.75. So, yeah, we've made a downward okay. adjustment. So, you're not then looking at the building as an actual build at 64? No, absolutely not. not considering not. that? No. Okay. No. Okay, any questions? Your vacancy rate, uh, you upped it to 5% from 1.8. Is that supposed to reflect more existing or current situation? I would say that that's specific to the property. Um, I don't think that's, um, again, the, the city's vacancy is derived by a model, so it has a general look at vacancy. Um, ours is specific to the property. Um, obviously, we're not going to go as high as 10.4. Um, there was a spike in that. That's probably, that's, again, there's some relation here to this, uh, the suites that are being refurbished. That's what I'm getting. Yeah. Um, so we wouldn't go that high. But again, you're seeing a higher than average vacancy over at least a three year period. So some of it has to be recognized now. Thank you. No further questions. Okay, and I have no questions. Thank you for that. Now we're coming to 303 delay. So you can proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next property has a file number of 19 3666. It has a roll number of 0607552500.
It is located at 303 Goulet Street. It is a residential apartment with one building and 10 stories. It, is, it has an actual and effective gear built of 1973. Also has 163 suites with 20 outdoor parking. The property is zoned as residential multifamily with a land area of 31,738 square feet, a planned area of 9,023 square feet, and a gross floor area of 87,891 square feet. On page three are a couple of aerial photos of the subject property. Page four is the income valuation summary. It has 162 units with an average month, monthly rent per unit of $642.24, which is model derived. It also has a vacancy rate of 1.8%, an expense ratio of 53.48%, giving it a net operating income of $570,355. Using the capitalization rate of 5.1%, we have a capitalized income of $11,183,431. On page 5 are some rent comparables. They are all ranging from $794 up to $1,314 average monthly rent per unit. Right below it, below it is the map of the subject property and the comparable rents. Pages 6 and seven are the capitalization rate charts. Um, beginning of page nine, the last page is the 2017 income and expense information for the subject property. And that's my presentation. Next question, please, <clears throat> um, You're aware that this is a Manitoba housing building? The owner is, yes, uh, on my page one. Okay. And you didn't make any adjustments to the capitalization rate because of that? Not the capitalization rate, but um, the potential rate is below average. Hmm. Is there any additional risk for this property being um, a Manitoba housing property, in your opinion? Risk? Um I'm not sure what kind of risk um, we're talking about here, but if we're if you were to have a potential owner or a potential purchaser looking at this property uh, to purchase it, um, you're aware of operating agreements for these properties. They have structured rents that they have to keep to. I'm not sure of those um, those scenarios. No, I don't know those. Um, Those are my questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so, page four of your brief is all model, right? Yes. Um, and page five, your rent comparables. Are any of the comparables one through three, are those Manitoba housing? No, there's not. They're not, okay. Um, so were those, the, were those the best comparables you could find just because the rents are considerably higher? Yes, they are considerably, considerably higher. However, um, the model has been um, adjusted to reflect a below average market rent uh, of $642.24 per unit per month. And um, I think that's accounting or that's showing that um, the actual income for this property is a rent, uh, income year rent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just gonna make sure of the ability to pay. Um, there's the, um, that's the uh, technical term that they use. And we have, or the model, uh, by adjusting it to below average rent, um, below average market rent, has considered that in the uh, in the valuation. Okay. So, um, if it's below market rent and it's a 73 build, 
Do you think a 5.1% cap rate is justified on it? Yes, because um, we have already considered um, the income to be lower, and there's no more there's no more added risk in terms of um, asking for more income because we have already considered that in the average monthly rent, which is way lower than what the market is. And you didn't inspect this property? No, I did not. Uh, page 11 of your brief. Uh, jump line down. Did you see the costs for task management? Which one? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, just here. It's about page 10. Page 10. Oh, page 11. 10 or 11? 11. 11, sorry. Task anyway. management? Yeah. Point five. Mm -hmm. Did you not agree? Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I noticed on your total units, uh, 126 of the 162 of that case, well, that's not a normal uh, arrangement of uh, suites for uh, a typical uh, apartment block, is it? Mm. No. Um, I guess this one is geared towards more of um, single. It was vehicles. built specifically for uh, ability to pay. That's one thing, yes. Um, it is. Um, in terms of what they're asking for, it, yes. And your typical client would be more of, of I guess, single person if um, there's more bachelor units. A lot more bachelor units. Yes. No one and two, well, one bigger, but no two bedrooms. None. Certainly. That certainly makes it a risky venture, doesn't it, if you buy it for the open market? Well, yes and no. Um, it may pose a risk in terms of uh, maybe fixing it up or uh, putting more money in it uh, for a buyer. And no, because uh, since it is actually asking for um, a rent based on income, I mean, actually the um, the lineup for these kinds of properties or apartments are just so long, and there's a lot of wait lists that you know vacancy is almost nil, if not minimum. But with this number of bachelor units, it almost feels like you could sell it as a hotel, as it rather than a living space. Could be, um, but I'm not sure if uh, it's gonna uh, sell as a hotel if there's a. Uh, a willing buyer there. I'm not sure um, how hotel investors look into these kinds of um, Well, the location may, location may not be appropriate. So it, it really reduces the value of the property. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Okay. Um. <coughs> right, I, I have no, uh, no questions, so we can proceed with the moment. Okay, um, I'll ask you to just turn to page 9 of the report. That is the last page. That is the word of The reason we ignore these financials that are submitted, um, and the assessor has included one year here, is, is that uh, um, typically financial housing doesn't charge market rents. Um, and we have to go by market rents. Um, so what we do is we do a scan of Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation rents. So Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation does an apartment rental study on every community in Canada, uh, larger communities, so Winnipeg would be one of those. Um, there is a blurb here that says 2015, this was fall 2017 data, um, and you can tell because it's slightly higher than what the assessor has actually estimated. Um, so we looked at 50 to 99 units built between 1975 and 1989 and Zone 10 in the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation study. So they have different data sets that pertain to each one of these things. And we've done an average of these for bachelors, one bedrooms, and two bedrooms. In the end, we've estimated at 90%. Um, again, GPI is 1,347,276. 
and overall average of 688.79 uh, per suite. Um, that is what we've applied in terms of the potential market gross rents. Um, to get into this issue of the market rents, um, these are not below market rents. These are appropriate for the area, appropriate for the type of units that we have here. And again, this is heavy on their bachelor suites, um, not on the one bedrooms, two bedrooms. Um, that is the reason why these rents are low, not because they're charging below market rents. Um, so we have an effective gross income of uh, $1,316,289. The expenses, we've used the same expense ratio as this city, 53.48%, giving us a net operating income of $612,337, slightly higher than what the assessor has um, predicted. Um, in terms of the capitalization rate, 6.25. Capitalization rate is um, higher for uh, a few reasons. Um, the mix count, 126 suites on uh, bachelors. That in itself creates risk. Um, the other factor that is important to us is the type of property. Um, so this is a rent here to income property. These rents stay with the property. They don't transfer from owner to owner. They're with the property. So if a potential purchaser were to purchase this property, they would be stuck with those rents. Uh, each one of these projects has a project operating agreement with them. It's over a term of 35, 40 years. Um, once that runs out, um, the Manitoba Housing Original Corporation could conceivably sell the building. But during that time frame when those, those agreements are still active, it can't be sold off. Um, and if they were, those rents would be attached to it. But any potential purchaser would be, be facing the same um, challenges as Manitoba Housing. Housing, as Manitoba Housing. Um, so here's the problems. Um, you have um, you have a wait list. Um, the assessor is right. There's not much vacancy. It's filled off of that wait list. Again, they can choose who they house in this. It is. It is basically a needs-based system, um, and they're scored on points. Um, there's those problems that come with it, bed bugs, uh, other types of issues. Um, they function on an economic rent, meaning that they cover enough to, f to cover their expenses, but nothing beyond that. So in terms of capital costs, there's not much going into the capital of these properties. And with Manitoba housing properties, that is one of the issues, is how to address capital repairs. Um, every once in a while, the federal government throws out some stimulus money at the provinces, and they grow, go through these phases of doing capital repairs on these properties. But otherwise, it's not built into the actual um, uh, financials of these properties. Um, so. That's another thing that, um, that limits um, and would be a risk in terms of a potential purchaser. Um, so we, we look at it from the perspective of it was built in 1973. It deserves this capitalization rate. Plus, we add a little bit of a premium because it is a mental housing building. So we've adjusted it to 6.25. Gives us a value of nine million seven hundred ninety-seven thousand four hundred dollars. That's what we're asking for. And that, I'm open for questions. Uh, any questions of Mr. Um It is a, it's a quick one. Um, it was mentioned that there were issues in terms of the livability of it, uh, meaning the maintenance of it is not being maintained really good. Is that um, what um, is being uh, said or about this property or um, just the repair and maintenance is low? Well, I, I think if you looked at the repair and maintenance on most manageable housing properties, you'd see that it's actually high, which is not relative to what we say because generally when we see high repair and maintenance, 
it's usually an indicator that the property is being managed well. That's not the case with manageable housing properties. It's high because of the turnover and um, unfortunately a lot of damage is done to suites. Now this may be a case where not, that's not particularly, uh, not particularly uh, it's not an issue because it's an elderly person's housing. Um, but there still tends to be a lot of wear on these things, and they're not refurbished like um, market market apartment buildings would be. Again, they lack that uh, that reserve that um, property owners put into their properties to account for those capital repairs over time. So, would the repairs and maintenance be more of um, to get this? this particular property to be more livable for those renters? More livable? Yeah, I, you know, maintain a um, decent uh, building. Um, yeah, I, I would say that uh, in general, Manitoba housing, they tend to be um, um, I, I don't want to use the improper language here, but they, they they receive a lot of wear on the suites. Uh, not typical of market. Again, you can't, um, um, residential tenancies don't um, buy these suites. So evictions are harder. Um, it's, it's, you're, not, you're not functioning in the market. So in general, it's, it's a premium that we put on Manitoba housing properties. That's the question I have. Okay, Karen, questions? Uh, just one. Did you, was this property brought before the board last uh, cycle? Are you aware? I don't think so. We didn't have it. And you or we may have had it. And uh, <laughs> here's, here's how this works. We have, we go through an RFP process for Manitoba housing like we do for a lot of um, uh, provincial departments. So we have to submit an RFP. It's an RFP for a certain amount of units. In this RFP, there are 17 units. Um, this is one of the units. How it relates to what we did last cycle, I can't tell you. Um, we had much more last cycle. So it and you didn't expect the property. I didn't, but I have been in this property. Um, it's been a few years, but um, um, I, I've been through a lot of the mental housing stuff in one day. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. Okay, I have no questions, but I note that um, also there's a, a liability classification appeal on this. Do you have any presentation on liability classification? I don't, but it is um, not profit, um, and it is um, elderly persons housing, so it would be effectively exempt from the school taxes. Um, we could have handled this in one of two ways. We could have either submitted the proper documentation to the city of Winnipeg, uh, in which case they would have exempted that portion of it, or they, um, or we can handle it through the, the, the board. Sorry, may I um, comment on that, Mr. Chair? On page one of my uh, brief, uh, the liability is grant already. Grant and taxes? Yes, that's yes, correct, right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, okay. <clears throat> just to speak to that, actually, the grant and move taxes, uh, that's, that's actually because it is a housing property. <coughs> now, the grant and move taxes means that they pay the same tax rate that a 60T class property would, which means full. Um, other uh, taxes. Um, this pertains to the specific issues of this being an elderly housing um, project. So 55, uh, 55 plus um, and um, and it would be and, and, and it's not for profit again therefore it would be exempt from school taxes. Now again we can do this one of two ways we can either handle it here or we can Submit the paperwork to the city when they get exempted. At some point, it's going to get exempted because, again, it does fall into that category of being only housing. Okay. 
Uh, we don't have to deal with it here. Yeah, I was going to say the difficulty we would have is that uh, you would have the onus on classification liability and you didn't present any presentation within the time frame, so we don't really have anything that's uh, correct. We can, we can deal with. All right. Uh, do you have anything you want to say on liability and classification? Just more on the ownership itself, um, Mr. Chair, that's all. But again, I mean, as uh, indicated by um, the applicant, uh, Mr. Navarro, um, they want to deal with it um, in a different um, different uh, situation or different uh, circumstances, I guess. If I yeah. Not right. um, so it's not being contested at this moment at yeah. this board. Yeah. Okay. Carrie, any questions on the lesson liability? No, thank you. And, yeah. Okay, thank you. That concludes this property. We come to our last property, 60 Glen Meadow. <coughs> so you can proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the last property has a file number of 19 2756. It has a roll number of 0802251400. It is located at 60 Glen Meadow Street. We're dealing with a roll number of 2020 using April, the reference date of April 1st, 2018. We have it assessed at $11,740,000. There are three buildings, oh, it's a, um, sorry, uh, it is a residential apartment with three buildings and three stories. It has an actual and effective year built of 1976 with 99 suites and 70 outdoors, outdoor parking stalls. It is zoned as residential multifamily with a land area of 150,147 square feet, a planned area of 33,171 square feet, and a gross floor area of 98,937 square feet. Uh, on page two, there's a um, registration date or a subject sale history in which the registration date, the date that it was registered, was May 7, 2018. Okay, that, that would be post-reference? Um, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, okay. it is a registration date, meaning it just went through the land titles. It may have been sold uh, prior to that, but I'll just leave it up to you if you want to. Um, if you want to put weight on it or not. Um, however, we are in a position where it is a registration date and sometimes it takes a few weeks uh, for land titles to uh, register such a sale. All right. Anything more to uh, Oh, no, continue oh. with your presentation. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just, uh, um, yes, um, the sale was between um, my uh, government, which is um, Manitoba Housing, and uh, the current owner right now, at uh, 11.08 million. And on page three are um, a couple of aerial photos, the subject property. On page four is the income valuation summary. The property has 99 units with an average monthly rent per unit of $1,029.44, which is uh, model derived. It has vacancy rate of 2.6% uh, and an expense ratio of 15.72%, giving it a net operating income of $587,013. Using the capitalization rate of 5%, the capitalized income is $11,740,260. On page 5 are some rent comparables. They're all ranging from 1,044 up to $1,286 average monthly rent per unit. Just below it is the map of the subject property and comparable rents. On pages 6 and 7 are the capitalization rate charts. And on page, uh, pages seven, oh, sorry, pages 9 till the last page, page 12, is the 2017 income and expense information. And that's my presentation. Okay. Thank you. 
Any questions, Mr. Miller? Yes. Are you aware of when the first sale was negotiated? No, I wasn't. And yet you included the sale in there. Yes. It's a registration date that I'm aware of or made aware of. So you could have actually just put the change in the ownership, which you did on your front page, and not have included that sale information, Mr. Frank? No, I included it because it is a sale, and I think there are some lags between the sale date and, on this case, it's four weeks prior to or after. You just said that you're not aware of when the sale was negotiated. No, it could have been negotiated way earlier than April 1, 2018, or who knows. Could it have been negotiated 20 days before the sale? Could be. Could be any month, yes. However, I mean, the registration date is when it went through the land title. So the matter is out there now. It can't be ignored. It's there. Yet your value is $700,000 higher than that sale value. Correct. It's modeled direct, yes. Okay. And we used 2017 income and expense statements, correct? This sale occurred in May 2018? Registered May 2018. So there could have been a change in the market from year-end 2017 to May 2018, correct? Rents usually go up once a year. There could be, yes. Okay. Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Carrie, any questions? No questions. Thank you. All right. Any questions? So these are one- and two-bedroom units and three-bedroom units. No bachelors. No. That's it. That's the only thing I have. Thank you. Thank you. On the financials of year 2010, I guess, yeah, it is a March 31, 2018, so that would be as current as possible. It shows rent based on ability to pay. Yes, that's correct, sir. Is that still the case with the new owner? I wasn't able to look at the 2018 statement or the one after that was submitted in spring of 2019. I only looked at this one, so it might still be the same. Okay. But you're not sure? No, I'm not sure. All right. And you don't have any evidence whatsoever about when the sale was actually negotiated? No, I don't, sir. All right. Thank you. You can proceed, Mr. Navarro. Okay. We're using a potential market rent of $1,349,892, a vacancy of 2.3%, laundry and parking. Is this an effective gross income of $1,380,318? An expense ratio of 55%. Is this a net operating income of $621,143? We've applied a 5.75% capitalization rate, and we have a value of $10,892,495. That is my presentation. Okay. Questions, Mr. Baldwin? No questions, Mr. Chair. Terry, any questions? No questions. Thank you. I'm sorry. I missed the cap rate. 5.75. NOI? NOI was $621,143. 
Well, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, do you know where the uh, is still right here to income on this? Um, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I, I was actually surprised by the sale. <laughs> yeah. Um, But your income van, how, how did you derive your stabilized income? So the expenses, we would have looked at the actual expenses. The income, um, the incomes are estimated. From CMHC data? CMHC data. Um, that's really the only source that we can get rents from. Uh, we have no other um, way of of um, estimating these things because they're right here to think. So they're much lower than, than what's actually in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I thank you for that. Um, so I guess that concludes this afternoon's hearing. Then. So thank you for your... Oh, just, to, just to finish up. Oh, I, I included the, the survey in this one. Um, so the rental market report for Olympic. Yeah. But you yeah. haven't seen one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so that concludes today's hearing. So thank you for your presentation and enjoy the hockey game tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Go to go. Yes. <laughs>